Hi, it's Tuesday, September the 5th, and I continue to read and wonder about the Lord's Prayer. I, normally, I'm doing a book of the Bible. Last week, I was doing a book from the Bible, Mark's Gospel. Uh, next week, I'll be doing another book from the Bible. Not quite sure which one yet. Um, but this week, Monday to Friday, I'm just doing the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I'm reading it from source material, basically Matthew's Gospel. That was yesterday. We'll look at it from Luke's Gospel today. Wonder about, you know, the differences. I will be thinking about the various ways that we say the Lord's Prayer um, from sort of 17th century Church of England, um, way that I grew up saying it to the way we say it in Roman Catholic Church today. Uh, the difference is how things come to be. I'm going to do all that kind of wondering, um, preferences and that kind of stuff. But also I'm going to spend some time just wondering about the prayer itself in, one, in any version. Um, I'm one of those people, and I know there are a lot of us, I can say the Lord's Prayer no problem at all without even thinking. My lips move, the sound comes out, boom, done. And it's sad sometimes that I do that, that I say it without thinking. And so um, I will spend some time uh, this week just thinking about the prayer, wondering about what this might mean and how that affects me and what that implies and all of that kind of stuff. It's just that, the actual try to make the prayer meaningful. Yesterday when we read from uh, Matthew's Gospel, um, I wondered about the prayer that starts with our Father. So why Father? And I wondered about that. And then it, at the end it was um, about um, uh, saving us from the time of trial uh, and, and, from, uh, and from evil. Um, or the evil one. So I wondered about evil and evil one and the difference and why I like one better than the other. And that's helped make the prayer meaningful for me yesterday. Uh, hopefully it had some meaning for some folks yesterday too, or it led you into your own uh, wondering. Um, and so today, well, let's see what happens. So here we go. This is Luke 11 verses 1 to 4. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. There it is. That's it. Um, that's the whole prayer in, in Luke's gospel. Uh, shorter than Matthew's, isn't it? Shorter than the way we say the Lord's Prayer. And yet the, the elements are there. Um, it, it also invites us to be aware, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't invite you, but it invites me. And it gives me a moment to just mention it. I have told you that, that we, we recognize Mark as the earliest gospel. And one of the things that we know uh, is that Luke and Matthew's gospels borrow from Mark's gospel. Big time. Uh, like verbatim. It'll, you know, Matthew will take it out or Luke will take it out or Luke will take most of it and Matthew will take some of it. But you can tell that they are familiar with Mark's gospel. It, 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 it's not very difficult for um, biblical scholars to sort that out, see that and, and, and sort of even map it out. There are things, however, in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel that are shared, but they didn't get it from each other because they are pretty much contemporary. Their, their gospels come to be at about the same time. So it's not like Luke could have referred to Matthew or Matthew could have referred to Luke. They could have looked up Mark, but they couldn't have looked at each other. And yet they have things in common that don't come from Mark. And so we recognize those things as coming from another source, a source that we don't have. Um... When I was in seminary, uh, biblical scholars will often refer to it as, as the Q source. Uh, Q is a German quell, which means source. So the source source. Um, some will call it the Q gospel or the Q documents uh, or just call it Q. Um, not to be confused with Q anon. Um, uh, or some people just call it the sayings gospel of Jesus. But there seems to have been a collection of things that Jesus said that Matthew and uh, Luke both are able to access. So do other Gospels, by the way, that we have not included in our Bible or, or other documents of that time. 
um, they seem to have access to a source that we don't have. I mean, maybe it existed until the destruction of the library at Alexandria. I don't know. Um, I don't know why it's gone, but it is gone. Um, however, we can put pieces together and start to imagine what it looked like. And, uh, and this prayer would likely be in that source. Does that change the way we read it? No. I just wanted to show off that I know some stuff. Um, I am struck uh, at how brief this is. And if this did come from, say, the Q source, um, and Matthew also went to the Q source, um, Luke's decided to trim it down more than Matthew. Or maybe Matthew decided to flesh it out. Um, but whatever, whoever is doing the editing or adding, Luke just seems to prefer the very simple brevity of it all. You know, do not bring us to the time of trial is how he ends it, period. Not about resisting evil or save us from the evil, evil one. No, no, just, just don't bring us to the time of trial. Time of trial, I, I like that. It recognizes that, that, that life is, often feels like a trial. We, we, are, we are trying and we are... Uh, being judged and this is basically saying you know try to keep us out of the struggle if you can God and we don't want to be judged do not bring us to the time of trial um, that's what it what, what it means to me and that's what I love about it um, now I, I mentioned I think um, Sarah Rudin before and her book uh, The Face of Water where she translates um, pieces of the Bible um, well-known pieces and uh, one of the things she talks about is how um, vocab of how context matters so much um in in ancient writing in koine greek which is what this was recorded in um uh, but in aramaic and hebrew and, and these languages it, it's not just the word where you and i where those of us who speak english where where we access and i've mentioned this before like 170,000 words we use commonly and millions of words that we can look up and we can sort of get um where we'll just use a nuanced word. They didn't have as many words. Koine Greek, we're looking at 9,700 words. So less than 10,000 words compared to the 170,000 you and I use. So instead of looking for a nuanced version of the word, how they put it in the sentence would affect its meaning. And that's harder for us to understand. Um, but Sarah believes very strongly that you need to understand context. So recognizing these gospels would would uh, would come out in a time when the Christian community, the followers of Jesus, were in fact being persecuted. Uh, it was a very bad time. Um, she would she would would suggest that we need to understand that do not bring us to the time of trial could be just as readily translated. Please do not let do not let the police catch us and torture us. Please do not, you know, um, put us in a situation where we have to recant our faith, give up our friends, lest we be fed to the lions. Like, it's that dramatic. Um, it's not simply, oh, please don't, don't let me be tempted by chocolate. I'm trying to diet. It's not that. Do not bring us to the time of trial. Do not bring us to that point where, where we will suffer and die for our faith. And that's the context that this prayer exists in. And, and knowing that, if that's the case, then, then I like Luke's brevity because the brevity speaks very loudly to me. It allows me to adapt it to my life where I'm not likely to be tortured and die for my faith. But it also speaks to a fundamental truth. And it's a prayer that I do make. I am prepared I think, to suffer and die for my faith. I don't know that I've ever actually suffered for my faith. I have been inconvenienced because of my faith. I have been discomfited <laughs> because of my faith. I don't know that I've suffered for my faith, but I do believe I'm prepared to. 
I do believe I would die for my faith. But I very, very much hope that that never has to happen. I don't want to die for my faith. Just because I'm prepared to do it doesn't mean I want to do it. In that first century and, and in the centuries to follow, there's often um, a veneration, a celebration of martyrs, people who have died for the faith. Um, you know, many of the saints that, 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 that are celebrated across uh, Christian community um, were martyred. They died for their faith. And, and sometimes that's held up as a, yes, absolutely. It's, you know, you are a more faithful person if you actually die for your faith than if you don't. Um, it, it's held up that way. Well, when I read this prayer, I recognize that that's not necessarily the case. I'm not saying that people have died for their faith are foolish or they, or, they, or they shouldn't have died. But I'm saying we can be totally faithful and still want to live. We don't need the glory of being a martyr. The prayer is, do not bring us to the time of trial. The prayer to God is, please do not bring us to that place where we must suffer and die to prove our faith. If it has to be, it has to be, but, but, but it's, not, it's not a desirable outcome. I would rather live for my faith. I would rather share my faith uh, in joy. I would rather witness these things happening as opposed to have my death inspire things to happen. I get that out of this prayer. And, and I appreciate it. And, and it's worth thinking about for me. It's like, you know, how, how far will I go for my faith? And how honest am I with my faith? There was a time when I was younger. Yes, pretty much every day up till now. Um, there was a time when I was younger that I would question my faith. Because the idea of dying for it worried me bothered me and I didn't think I was up to it. I thought as a faithful person, I should really get used to the idea of dying and maybe put myself in a position where I could die for my faith. Um, I have shared with, oh, I don't know, over the years of these meditations and with some close friends way, way back, like 90, oh yeah, probably 1990, 91, uh, when I worked in, 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 in the Toronto AIDS clinic. Um, and uh, I thought I was more authentically there as a, as, a, as, a, as a religious presence, as a loving presence of God. I thought I was more authentically there if I did not mask and gown. Even though the potential for infection was high. Um, even though I was, in a sense, putting my family at risk. But it felt to me the brave, faithful thing to do. Until the day I was attacked by a man who had dementia and had AIDS. And, and there was blood. Um, and I went through a very terrifying few months of, of worrying that I had contracted um, HIV disease. Um, and wondered about my brash arrogance. Well, part of that brash arrogance was, I want to die for my faith. And the truth is, I don't want to die for my faith. I want to live for my faith. I am prepared to die for my faith. If it comes to that. But if there's another way. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We just read this recently in Mark's Gospel. If there's another way, God, I don't want this cup. If it has to be, it has to be. But if there's another way, that is what comes up in this prayer for me. And it is an opportunity for me to reflect on what does it mean when I say that I am willing to die for my faith? Am I also willing to live for my faith? What is it that, that, that I experience now and, and how far am I willing to go? Um, yeah. Huh. Last week I did an ending and a beginning. Uh, I did beginning and an ending. Here I just went to the last line. Let me let me jump back to to the opening line. Father, hallowed be thy name. Um, yesterday I talked, I wondered about Father, but hallowed be your name. 
also is interesting to me. Um, if I say a version of the Lord's Prayer that doesn't include hallowed be your name or be thy name, uh, it feels uncomfortable to me. I like hallowed be your name. It's my favorite part, maybe. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Um, or just here, Father, hallowed be your name. It, it's there in the text. I love it. As a kid, I loved it, even when I didn't know what hallowed meant. Uh, and as an adult now, I love it, even though I'm not always sure what hallowed means. Are, are you sure? I mean, I know you can look it up, but when you say it, you know, like, what is it? What is, what is Halloween? All Hallows Eve. What is All Hallows Day? What is, what is hallowed ground? What is our Father hallowed be thy name? What does hallowed mean uh, when we say it? What does it mean to you? And the shortest, easiest, I suppose, almost synonym, I guess, uh, is, is holy. In fact, I've heard it translated that way. Our Father, holy be your name. Um, that tends to be the way we translate it. Holy be your name. And so it's, it's acknowledging God uh, and recognizing that God is holy. And we should always treat God as holy. And, yeah, I think that that's true. I think that it's true um, in terms of the way we live our faith. I think it's true theologically. I think it's informative and helpful and true. So, there you go. Father, hallowed, holy be your name. Every time we say God, every time we reflect on God, let it be a holy time. Let us recognize that, that we are... Uh, in the presence of the holy other, something bigger, more everything-ish than, than are we. Let us breathe softly. Let us take off our, our shoes. We're on hallowed, holy ground. Um, let us recognize that this is special. Let us never take it for granted. I like that. Hallowed, however, doesn't simply, doesn't just mean holy. It can also simply mean revered. Somebody can be hallowed who's not a religious figure, who does not play a spiritual role in your life or anybody's life. Um, they can still be hallowed. We don't use the term that often, but it's also part of it. And and I like to reflect on that, too. Um, because as much as I engage in the mystery of the Holy Other and recognize that God is, is that Holy um, Other, meaning God's identity is separate of mine and, and, and is different from me, and therefore we can have a relationship. You don't have a relationship with yourself. You have a relationship with, with the Other. I... All of that is vital and, and important to me. But again, within this mystery of things, I don't like to push God away and make God distant. Whereas if when I say God is holy, if for me, I am, I am making God distant. Because I'm mundane, not holy. Right? I am secular, not religious. I am of the world, not of heaven, however we want to make that division. But I am, uh, at my core, a Christian, meaning Jesus informs my faith. And in Jesus, God and humanity are one. God is, Jesus is, fully human and fully divine, fully God. Uh, it's a mystery how that can be, but there it is. And so, for me, in Jesus... There is no longer a distinction between the religious and the secular, the holy and the mundane. That's gone in Jesus. We are in this now together. And sometimes when I make God too holy, when I am only willing to speak of God in hushed whispers, I feel I push God away. I want to recognize God. 
in my life when I'm walking my dog. I want to recognize God in my life when I'm losing my temper. I want to like recognize God in my life when I'm laughing, when I'm digging in the mud. I want to recognize God when I'm, you know, playing with my granddaughter or 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 nuzzling my wife. Uh, I want I want God to be all part of all of that. I don't want to push God away from my human experience. Right? So when I hear hallowed be your name, I'm invited to wonder what that means. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't dream to correct what Luke has written here or Matthew. I wouldn't dream to correct Jesus. Say, oh, have you got the right word for that, Jesus? No, no, Jesus has the right word, but it's an invitation for me to wonder about how it's the right word for me and what I gain and what I lose um, when I make God holy or too holy. The holier I make God, does that mean the dirtier, the more mundane I make myself? I'm invited to think about that in this prayer. Um, yeah. And I guess I should wonder a little bit about your kingdom come. For some, that's your kingdom come means, well, if we get rid of all the crap that rules us now. I think it probably meant that to a lot of people then. Again, we're talking about context. Uh, pff, Jerusalem was falling. Christians were under attack. Everything was very, very difficult. Oh, if God would only come and provide order and safety and freedom and all those things that they wanted. Um, yeah, God, your kingdom come. And today I look around my world and what's going on in it. And yeah, I go, yeah, you know what? Every system that, that runs my life, I would love to just let, just be cut loose from all of them. Whether I'm talking about a government I voted for or Amazon from whom I deliver, who I order things to be delivered to my door, uh, or social media. If I could just be cut free from all of that and just be... In, in, in the world as God desires it. Um, but when the prayer is your kingdom come, for me, that talks about approach. And, and when I think about it, I think it's, you know, God, how my prayer is, is that I can be part of making this world more like God's world. Which may be why Matthew has in earth as it is in heaven. Luke doesn't, just says your kingdom come. But this idea that that the kingdom is coming, and I don't think it arrives all at once, personally. Language doesn't tell me one way or the other. But when I think about it, when I think, what does it mean when your kingdom come? For me, it means progressively it is here. And so it's here more today than it was yesterday. If I if I'm engaging with it, if I'm doing the work, it might be here even less tomorrow because we stopped engaging. I don't know. But this idea that it's always it's always coming, it's always imminent, and, and I'm invited to be part of the not replacing this world with God's kingdom, but moving this world, transforming this world into what God desires, into what God would have us do as as a as a as a community. I don't know, incomplete thoughts, and I'll probably come back to it uh, tomorrow a little, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. I think I'll just, I think I'm just going to offer you the prayer again for you to wonder about, and then, uh, and then we'll get on with our day. So, following Luke's example of Jesus, let us pray. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Amen. As I said it just there, not to go back into wondering, but I'm going to, that line your kingdom come. What it started to say to me as I said the prayer that time was, 
So the next time I have an opportunity to vote, the next time I have an opportunity to volunteer my time or my gifts, the next time I have an engagement with another person, um, let my actions be guided by God and not by the other kingdoms. The kingdoms of partisan politics, the kingdoms of nationalism, the, the kingdoms of consumerism, the kingdoms of so many things. Let your kingdom come into my heart, into my life, into the world. And it's going to do that through the things that I do. Hmm. I got more wonder to do today. I'll probably bring it up again tomorrow. Anyway, that's it for me now. Until I get to see you again, God bless you. Um, please know what that means. At least when I say it, what I mean is that God sees you as you are where you are right now. And God loves you. And, and it's not just that God loves you in this moment, but God's love also moves through you into the world. And it does transform you a little bit. But even more than that, it does transform the world around you. You matter. You make a difference. God bless you. Thank you for being you. And uh, hope I get to see you tomorrow. Until I do, God bless.